My name is KJ Relf. I am a programmer with the Archive, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to night four in our ongoing series, Liberating Hollywood. Tonight we'll be seeing Number Our Days and Testament, both by the incredible Lynn Littman, who is here with us tonight. Um, I should mention that we were very lucky to get a preserved 16 millimeter print of Number Our Days from the Academy Film Archive. And uh, the 35 millimeter print of Testament is from the Lynn Littman collection, which she claims she wasn't aware existed <laughs> um, at the Academy Film Archive. Um, so we're so thrilled to see all of you here tonight, especially on a rainy night. I know it's really hard to make an excuse to leave the house, but this is a great excuse to leave the house and come um, watch two incredible films together. So just a note about the program for tonight, we'll be watching the films back to back and then uh, with no break in between. And then uh, Lynn and I will come on stage and talk a little bit about both of them and, uh, and her career after, uh, after we screen Testament. Um, so I also wanted to mention that tomorrow night We'll be screening a 35 millimeter archival print of Anne Bancroft's Fatso, and um, that's a very it's a very rare screening. It's very rare that Fox lets some a 35 millimeter print out of their vault, so we're very lucky to have that. And we'll be joined by Jonathan Sanger um, to discuss a little bit about the the history of the film and his experience knowing and working with Ms. Bancroft. Um, so thank you so much again for coming out tonight. And the occasion for this series um, is the publication of a new book that was that just came out in December 2018, available from Rutgers University Press, written by Maya Montañez Smuckler. So I'd like to ask Maya to join us on the stage to uh, talk a little bit about the book and the films that you're here to see tonight. Maya. Thank you, KJ, who worked so hard putting this series together. So something that we have talked about in um, the last couple of nights of uh, liberating Hollywood and something that KJ and I had really worked on as, as we put together this series is the, the theme, which is this intersection in the 1970s between the feminist movement and Hollywood, American cinema, independent cinema at that time. And what that intersection and sometimes a collision, how that impacted the small but growing number of women who were directing feature films. And so there is this point in this series that is organized around gender for sure. And of course, issues of discrimination and sexism is something that we talk about in this series and certainly is one of the main three lines in my book. But what is almost more important is that the filmmakers that we are profiling, that we are showcasing in these series are individual artists. And while they are, they have this commonality that they're women, they are all individual filmmakers with um, unique visions that they bring to their work. And so tonight, we are so pleased to have Lynn here. And for me personally, it means so much that we can screen these films <clears throat> and that Lynn is here to talk with us. When I first started on this project, I was a doctoral student at UCLA uh, Film Studies program, and I was able to contact Lynn and ask her for an interview, and she was so gracious. This is like, I don't know, 2011. It's a long time that this project has been... Um, cooking and she was just fabulous and she gathered up um, several of her colleagues who had organized in the late 70s and early 80s at the Directors Guild and who these six women radicalized the Directors Guild for the first time and she helped put together an epic night of eight hours at her fabulous house and really opened up for me this history and these first person accounts of her and her colleagues and what their experiences were in the film industry in the 70s and 80s and personally as artists, as filmmakers, their interests and their passion and their ambition and their drive to do the work um, that they really 
felt uh, they deserved the opportunity to pursue. And that just changed everything for me as a graduate student to be able to be here now with you all um, to celebrate this occasion. So I am so grateful for tonight um, and that Lynn is here. Lynn's work is, is really representative of some interesting sort of uh, combinations and opportunities that are happening in the 70s and then with Testament, which was um, made in the early 80s that continue, that Lynn has a career at KCET making, do we call them documentary film? Or more like, uh, what do you call it, Lynn? Um, TV uh, magazine shows. Say it again. Okay, Phil Nets on KCT in the 70s. And so that is, um, we can see the connection then with the documentary, with her short documentary that will also screen tonight. But that she also then was able to expand her creative vision and her interest to make a feature film with Testament. And that's really exciting for us to be able to see this um, very innovative trajectory of her professional and her creative career with the short documentary and then this very epic, iconic feature film. So thank you all for coming and please stay for the Q&A with KJ and Lynn and enjoy. I'm glad I'm wearing black. <laughs> <laughs> Do you wanna tell everyone what you said your nickname was earlier? when we were talking earlier? Death Queen. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you had just seen Testament pretty recently, right? Like a couple. Yeah, but somehow it wasn't, it didn't, I don't know whether it's because so many of my friends are here that um, um, my goodness, what a crazy person I am. <laughs> Uh, the terrible thing is that this asshole, that we that this is not out of date. That's what's so awful about it. Yeah, I was specifically this is not out of date. That all the phones would go off, all our little things would go away, and then we'd just be left with ourselves and each other. It's a terrible film. I mean, <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> well, to not, terrible film how in how you're feeling it's relentless right now. it's <laughs> relentless I mean after a while I just thought shit they're all gonna die <laughs> and they did it was very hard to sell <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was also thinking this isn't just a Lynn Littman double feature. It's also a Meyerhoff double feature because well, she worked with you on both projects. Do you want to talk a little bit about meeting her? I'd like to talk about the first film we watched too a little bit. So that was, I really was happy. I hadn't seen the old Jews in a very long time. <laughs> and they really, I love them. I just love them. Um, Barbara and I met at a, at, at a woman's conference. Um, she had written, she had been studying these, the, the old people, and she came from a rather, she, she came from Chicago, and a completely different background than I came from, which was New York and the Bronx, and speaking Yiddish. And so she was a brilliant scholar of a group of people whom she hadn't really lived among. She was, of course she was Jewish, but it was a different kind of upbringing that she had. And I came from, she, in other words, she came with all the knowledge and I came speaking Yiddish. So um, we were a wonderful, we were a wonderful team. We, we adored each other, we respected each other, and we never crossed boundaries. She did one, she did one, she did, she did the thinking and I did the doing. I mean, I, I don't mean that in a bet, you know. We just would, we were perfectly complimentary. Um, of course, she never got to be an old Jewish lady. She died at 49. And I made a film about her last work, which she did, which was in the, in the 
Orthodox community on Fairfax. I didn't want to go back to Jews. I had done Testament, and I sort of felt like I'd had I'd had enough Jews. But it was her work, and and I. It wasn't that I owed it to her. I owed it. I owed it to her. I mean, I loved her, and um, and um, I only make sad films, and I'm kind of a funny person. But you, you two make beautiful collaborators. Yeah, we were wonderful. She, yeah. she really um, helped me think, think through. I would, I would give her an instance, and she'd give me the myth behind it. She, she, she just was, she was educated in a way that I will never be. Um, and she, her mind, she just made wonderful human as well as intellectual connections, and that, that's a, that's a gift. She was a gift. She, the, the film is so beautiful and won an Oscar for best documentary. The old Jews won an Oscar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't. I don't think we mentioned that before, but really, it's it's a sweet film. I hadn't so seen sweet. it. I haven't seen it in like thirty years. It's hard to see. Uh, yeah. The first time I'm seeing it is tonight. Honestly, I sweet. <laughs> it sort of gets wiped out by the next one. But <laughs> <laughs> but you did. Um, Speaking of, of Barbara, you did c continue a relationship with her until she passed. And so when you were, I want to talk about the genesis of Testament also, but you brought her in to work on that as well. I brought her in to think it through with me and to figure out why why it was worth, why. I mean, the, the story was a three-page story that had been printed in, I forget, it was a Catholic journal. And then Ms. picked it up and, and reprinted it, and I read it there. It was an extraordinary three-page story. It had almost everything in it that the film does in three pages, which either means that she was enormously skillful or I was just sloppy and, <laughs> and whatever. Um, but I, it, you know, it, it was a shocking story. It did, it didn't, it, it shocked you. And it was at the stage when we were politically at a, at a very frightening point in terms of whether we were going to be involved in a nuclear war of any kind. And, um, and I had two sons, and one was still in nurse, one was in nursery school, and I remember having a nightmare of how I would get to him. And I remember thinking I would walk across the tops of cars um, to the nursery school. Um, so it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for, for Carol Amen, who wrote the story. John Young, I think, did, a, did an extraordinary job. He did a wonderful script. I had knew nothing about scripts. I had never worked with. Um, and he's a novelist too. Right? I, 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 he's an, he's an. I didn't know that. Yes, he. I picked him because not because of any of this. He'd written many, many screenplays, and movie television movies. But he wrote this book called The Weather Tomorrow. And in it, I mean, he wrote women. He wrote women beautifully. And um, that's why. And he was wonderful. He was, a, we were all assholes, but he was, um, <laughs> some were more difficult than others. Um, um, the director of photography, Stevie Poster, is here. And what, I don't know where you're sitting, Stevie, but what a beautiful, what a beautiful, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The shoot was only 21 days, is that right? The shoot was 24, I think. Is it 20? Yeah. Um, it was perfect for the mood. <laughs> it just was one more, one more factor. Um, yeah, it did, it rained constantly. Um. <laughs> and so the, the shift, because this was your first narrative feature that you were directing, you'd worked in documentary and in television before that, and you found this story, you were not obsessed by it, but so interested in turning it into something. And so what, what was that transition in working like, or was it much of a transition? Well, the television where I worked was public television, which was extremely, women were allowed to work. There were images of women who were executives, who were producers, who were doing it. 
Um, and public television, in that sense, was a gift. Um, there was no money, which is probably why they were able to <laughs> why they were able to employ women. Um, <laughs> but um, but it was I I had I had a gifted I had a gifted work experience um, my whole my whole my whole life. Um, I I never was told I couldn't do anything, and the things that I was that I wanted to do, I, I don't want to say I was allowed to do, but I was allowed to do. And the difference between really being able to do what, what's in, what comes from inside you, um, as opposed to getting handed something to do, is the most enormous difference in the world. I mean, it, it, even if it's even if there's, there are obstacles along the way, you're doing what you what you love. And that's that's an enormous that's an enormous gift. Um, it, it, that's an enormous rare gift, and probably more rare for women, perhaps than I'm, I'm sure than for fellows. But it's tough. The, the it I don't know why I had the lucky experience, but I did, and I took advantage of it. And um, it's probably because there was no money, which eliminates the possibility for for in, you know for castles in Spain, um, and um, and therefore changes that whole power dynamic. If nobody is becoming ridiculously wealthy and powerful, then you play together. Then then you play together, and and I and and that, that that's the working experience I've had. So it's been very lucky. Um, and isn't Jane wonderful? Wasn't she wonderful? Wasn't she amazing? And Nominated Rossi. for an Oscar amazing. for the performance and a Golden Globe yeah. we were talking about earlier. Yeah, she's incredible. And so the the film did start off as a television production. It was made for yeah. public television. It was made for, for something Playhouse. called American Playhouse, um, which the, the, the head of which who, the head of which is a wonderful man named Lindsay Law, who taught me what an what a what a really good executive is, and that's somebody who, who comes around and makes life better. <laughs> um, and that's that's almost as rare as being a gifted director, perhaps more rare because there are more of them. But um, that that it, I mean, James Horner's score knocked me out, knocked me out. What a gorgeous piece of music. Do you remember how he got involved? I was I was introduced to him by this magical man named Joel Sill, who was the music supervisor, who has been doing music in Hollywood for movies for almost for 40, 50, 30 years, whatever. And um, we went to lunch, and he had a, I'll never he had a tuna fish sandwich. And James Horner. Had James a tuna Horner. Fish sandwich. And I said <laughs> something about my budget. My budget was ten thousand dollars for a score, and 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 that was enormous for me. And he said yes, and then finished the tuna fish sandwich. And <laughs> <laughs> and then the next time I saw him, I mean the music part of putting music to film, which probably most of you know, is you, I, I felt and I I I I am I have a music background. It's the least control moment of anything, of anything, of anything, because how do you tell somebody what to create? How do you, how do you say that note goes there? <laughs> but he, uh, that's what his, I mean, it, it was wonderful. Again, another, an amazing, I had, I can't, I, I can't call it a collaboration, but boy, was he a gift. <laughs> There's also so much of the film that doesn't have a score. That's just Boy. every day, like living. And but then when it finally comes back at the end, it's so, it has such an impact. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say. Say something to me. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, well, I, I was going to ask a little bit too about. Um, I mean, part of the book, the part of the book that um, where you have 
so much focus in in um, Maya's book is really about your activism work and about your work in really mobilizing. About my which work? Oh, about your work in kind of mobilizing the DGA oh. to, uh, and so up until maybe the early 70s, the DGA was kind of sitting out, the Directors Guild of America was sitting out of the kind of politicized conversation about equity and parity and SAG was a little bit more advanced and the WGA, but the Directors Guild was kind of not participating in this conversation, but. Well, it was pretty much of an all boys club. Um, and, and that's not to say that directing is easy or getting films made was easy for anybody, it wasn't. But um, despite my own good fortune in terms of not being stopped, I, I, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I never wanted to do episodic television. Um, I, I, I felt that, that it was a, a great skill, there was no question, but that one was replaceable. And that was unbearable for me in terms of the amount of energy and stuff that it takes to work on a set. I couldn't bear the fact that the job of episodic television was to, was to it at best as possible, keep doing what had been set up as a style and a, and a way of working. Um, but that was, that is still the area that where women can make a living, a good living, and work. And, and it's also measurable. So in terms of taking on a political fight, um, which I did with, with five other colleagues who were directors at the Directors Guild, it was a measurable thing. And at that point, the Equal Opportunities, EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, was in full force. There was a backing for the, there had been a, it was the height of the women's movement. We had support. Um, and there was something magical that was their premise, which was called goals and timetables, which was, you say you want to, you say you want to be a good guy. These are the numbers of, these are the numbers of women we want you to hire by this period of time. And therefore, people could be accountable as opposed to just having good thoughts. And we took on, we, we, we were not part of the Directors Guild, although we were all members. We weren't, as they are, as the women there are now, a committee, a very well-supported, cooperative, good, I don't, shouldn't say good girls, but they're, <laughs> not, they're not there to burn the house down. And, um, and we were. And um, and we did we did some good, we did some good. We made a, we made a lot of noise, and and I think made people aware of the inequity in terms of women directing. And at that point, we had the support of the guild of an amazing man named Michael Franklin, who supported what we were doing. Which was he was an old union guy, and the directors guild, had, after all, a union, and it's supposed to yeah. do its stuff. I mean, for anybody who remembered what unions were. Um, um, so we had we had a friend in court, but we were definitely not of the guild. Um, we didn't manage goals and timetables, and still haven't. Yeah, there's. St I mean, just last year there was this push for um, fifty fifty by twenty twenty, right? I mean, we're still talking about it. It's still, it we're still not there. Well, that's true of many things. <laughs> um, yes, I don't, I don't, until they, until there's consequence, until there are goals and timetables and consequence, it, it won't happen. I mean, because what, when a woman gets hired, she's taking a job away from a guy. So it's just as simple as that. And right now, and, and that's, that's huge. Um, so there's a fight. Um, it's not about ability. It's about finance. Um, and also, when you get to work, you get better at working. So it is, in that sense, about ability. The tragedy of, 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 e of un e un unequal employment is that you don't, women, women haven't had the opportunity to get really good at what they do because they don't get to do it a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's practice, practice, practice. That's sort of old fashioned, but it's. 
I think that's kind of the narrative that we're seeing with this whole series, especially with you know Joan Tewksbury or Jane Wagner. They were kind of held up as these tokens in a way or these examples and they were given a chance and when that chance didn't go the way that they wanted that that the studio or the money wanted it to that was your only chance right you know whereas someone like I, I don't want to name names but whereas there there are other directors who can make mistakes and have flops and still get second third fifth chances also you learn how to have courage I mean you, you, you start out with it, but you have to, you, you learn how to have, have courage too. It's, it really is a kind of, making a film, for me anyway, it is a kind of going to war, although I've never been in the army, but y you, you have to go in naked and dressed in armor at the same time. So it's, it's a very um, demanding, demanding, demanding um, occupation. Um, I, I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to turn to the audience um, because I know that there must be some questions out there. Um, I heard some Ask me something. Yeah, <laughs> back there. We have a microphone coming to you if you'll wait. Thanks. Oh, she could talk louder than Kate. What year was this film made? Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. What year was the film made? It was made in 83. So we're 30 years out, and we're right back where this film starts. That's really. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe how timely it seemed to me with, you know, with all these, what do you call them, um, agreements, treat. We have had an agreement for over 30 years with the Russians about missiles and building, you know, not a restriction on nuclear war. And now it's just falling apart before our eyes. And here you come with this 30-year-old film, and it's 2019, and it might as well be 1983. That's what's so awful. I know. Lynn was was part of this film, uh, making this film for you, outside of the very personal story, was part of it about activism or about, like, were, were you involved in any sort of, like, disarmament movements? No, and I knew nothing about nuclear nuclear stuff. I mean, I got, I got somewhat educated, but it was not, it, this was a story about loss for me. I mean, this is a story about human loss and what must not, what must not be experienced by, by civilization, what must not be experienced. Um, it's loss of loss of every loss of love, loss of everything, and and it, it's funny to have approached it from it's not funny to have approached it from the negative, but I guess that's who I am. <laughs> um, it's unfathom it's unthinkable that that I I I doubt that the president because I don't know that he would be moved by family. I mean, there's no, no area where one can touch him, except perhaps financially, that would make any difference. So it would have probably no effect. Um, but it, it, it certainly felt, it, we, 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 we purposefully, we didn't have the money to do any special effects, nor would I want to. The, the big challenge that, that we had was, was getting was making a whiteout. I had to run back and forth to somebody named Minkler, who I think is still a very famous now graphics person, in order to get the screen to go completely white. Um, it was somehow impossible. I don't know what the problem was, but that was our big effect. <laughs> and um, that was done afterward, not in camera. That no, was no, done no, that in was post in post production. It was. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> At any rate, it worked. I mean, I think. Um, but I don't know why it was, that, it was such a big deal. But we, I wasn't interested in special effects at all. Um, you know, the big thing was getting the water brown in the, in the sink 
when she lifts Scotty up? <laughs> How do we start out with clean water and get it to be brown water when she lifts him up in one shot? I think we pumped something up from, anyway. Um, that was our big effect. That's the scene that stays with me. The little boy? I, yeah, I can't forget that scene. It's so, and then with the towel and yeah, when she picks him up. Yeah. Are there other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, in the back with the hat. Well, if you can wait for the microphone. Very, very obviously compelling and wonderfully done. And it's a film that would never be made today, I'm sure of that. <laughs> and uh, I just had an idea, about an idea about the treatment of the flashbacks. Did you go into the script knowing you'll do the, the other side of the, of the happy life and do the flashbacks on set, or was that in post? It was the first thing we shot because it was the only thing that I knew how to do. I mean, it was documentaries. We, uh, we I shot little documentaries. First day, I think we started out shooting that. On because, 16. Because, uh, because I knew how to do that. <laughs> I wasn't sure I knew how to do any of the other part, but I knew how to do that. Um, so it made me feel safe, and it was it it, it was breathable. Um, so yes, I, I yes I I knew I was going to use it. It I don't it wasn't I don't it wasn't in the original story. Um. Yeah, right down here in the front. You can wait for the microphone, thanks. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could tell us the name and a little more about the follow-up film you did with Barbara Meyerhoff that you just mentioned. Oh, um, the film that I did about following, shortly following Barbara's death was called In Her Own Time. And um, it really is about, ortho it's or the, the, the Orthodox Jewish community in the Fairfax area really fell in love with her and and were aware that she was dying and opened opened up all their rituals for for our film i mean we filmed in a in a in a mikvah which is a a bath a, a religious bath ceremony everybody um they loved her and the thing about documentaries that i and 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 that that happened to me is that I got very, I got pretty good at, at getting into people's kishkas, into their souls, into their into their hearts, and and the better I got at it, the more responsible I got to feel, and that got to feel. Um, that's that's what the the gift that they gave me became a burden because I was walking in and out of their lives. And, and it got, and sometimes I got to wish I knew that they, it would go differently. And the minute I found myself wanting to push their real lives around, I thought, okay, this is time, this is time to go to fiction, to go, to leave real people alone. And it was because I got into their hearts and they gave me their stuff. Um, it's a, it was a funny, Burden, terrible, wonderful, terrible, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, responsibility, right? Yeah, they don't yeah. disappear. I mean, I leave and go on, and they stayed in touch with me, and after a while, it got impossible. It, it got impossible. I, that's so funny to say. I mean, it's a luxury, but it was, anyway. Did you have a screening of Number Our Days for the community oh, that yeah. was filmed? Yeah. But they they, they they were not happy that they didn't pick up the Oscar. I had a, I had I had a real I mean they were they were really they were sort of glad about it. But why weren't they there? And they were right, you know. They were um, um, it was, they were tough. Bertha, the wonderful Bertha, who walks along with my, and sits with Mike. She was the roughest. She never forgave me, and I felt like she the day before I got married. Um, I had a car accident, and I was on my way down to the Israel Levin Center, and I felt like they cursed me. <laughs> I mean, they're they're powerful. They were powerful, and and uh, they were powerful. They were wonderful. More questions from the audience? Um, yeah, um, in the, the room. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Right. Sorry, next to Sam. I don't think you think people need a microphone. Hi, Lynn. It's Sophie. Hi, honey. Um, this is very nice. It's my friends here. <laughs> so I'm earth shatteringly blown away. This is my first time watching both, but particularly the second. I, can I can't even find the language right now. I'm in a non almost in a nonverbal zone. But can you say a little bit about directing the children? Because I was, whoa, blown away. Um, how did you talk to them about what this movie was about? Especially, I mean, Lucas they Hoskins. do it. Kids, I mean, I've also had ghastly experience, one ghastly experience with a child. I mean, Lucas was magic. Lu Lucas, Lucas, L Lucas was magic. He was six. Um, he was an, he was a baby. Um, I said to him, your dad has, has, has been killed. Your dad is been, is not going to come back. He's, he's in, he, he couldn't come back from San Francisco. And he said to me, I know there was a nuclear bomb. I mean, he was way ahead of me. The thing is that they're, that kids are amazing, you know, kids are amazing. The school play, they just did it. I mean, there's nothing you can tell them if they're lousy and hammy and looking at the camera. You just get, you have to get rid of them. They're not going to get better. So when they're wonderful, they're wonderful. Um, um, You're um, giving them a lot of credit, but I want to give you some credit. Sorry. <laughs> there was a question Laura. in the front here. Oh, oh. oh good. Yeah, we're they children. were amazing. The, they were amazing. Roxana was amazing. The girl, the little, wasn't she? Was the, I couldn't get over it. And Rossi was wonderful. I mean, I had models. I had these two sons. <laughs> and they're all of Alex's toys. Every single super guy is in there. <laughs> Every guy that he fed, I'd watched, you know. <laughs> so it, then the costumes, I, I took his cost, his Zorro costume. Um, so it was, it, there was no separation between my life and what was in front of me. But you really can tell when they're lousy. That I didn't have that at all. The little mayor who flew, flubbed his eyes and, uh, flubbed his eyes and had no teeth. I mean, he, we, you couldn't get anything better than that if he had spoken correctly. Wouldn't have been as good. Yeah. And, and many of their parents, the kids' parents were in the audience. So they were really, the, 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 the tears were real. I mean, they were knocked out. They were knocked out. It was Sierra Madre and, and it was a tiny town and everybody came out. We, we just stayed there. And you were, uh, the, the on-set experience was probably, I mean, your first narrative on-set experience, really, and the... I had only one terrible, one terrible moment, and it didn't matter because I was surrounded by my friends and people I trusted, when I heard a guy say, she reminds me of my ex-wife. Oh <laughs> and I thought, I thought, oh, God. <laughs> I didn't. I stepped on his feet. <laughs> There's a gentleman there. Oh, can you wait for the mic? Thanks. Sorry, I can't hear. Just curious if you made any nods to any characters from the first documentary in the if I feature. Did you make any reference to any characters from the first film in the second that we just would not pick up on unless you told us? I'm anybody anybody from the Israel Center who you modeled a character from? In the, okay, just curious. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Carol Eamon, this well, I mean, Mako, who was one of the great actors of the uh, actors, of the, the Mike's gas station, um, was invented. He was not in the original story. The, the side characters were not, were not part of the original, but, but, but the original story was there in John Young. I mean, Karoshi, 
is magic. I don't know how we, I, he's magic. I think I had made a documentary with, with children with disabil learning disabilities or, you know, and, and had the idea that we should have somebody completely undirected, out of control, un, you know, who he was. And he did it. He did it. And when he said, oh, God, after he said, your father won't come back, and out of him came, oh, God. Yeah. It's just, I mean, real stuff is really better. <laughs> I think, whatever. Right down here, yeah. Yeah, the, the people who, the characters who embody the story, it's obviously a very much a strength. And um, yeah, to echo off everyone else, um, what was the casting process like? What How was the? The casting process. How did you find Jane, William, well, Jane had gone to college with. She Lucas. was a little bit ahead of me in college, and I had her phone number, which is very handy. <laughs> if you've never done anything before, <laughs> and you have a phone number, you use it. Um, I was a little worried she'd just come off of winning many awards for playing Eleanor Roosevelt. And I was a little worried that, you know, that she'd be arch, and she wasn't. Um, Margie Simpkin um, was, a, was scared the hell out of me. I had never worked with a casting person before. And she just scared the hell out of me. And then, um, so I sort of listened, and she had very good ideas. And, and I hate casting, as opposed to many people who really love it. I hate it. I hate, I hate saying no to all the people whom I would normally know who come in and just are not right. But it's awful. I, I, it's awful. Um, it's wonderful when you, when you have somebody's phone number and you know they can do it. <laughs> and, you, um, um, and, and the big shock about, about the casting process was that she left. I thought she was going to stay with me. We spent, I don't know how many weeks, in a room together making these critical decisions. And then when we finished, she left. And I felt... I, I couldn't, <laughs> I didn't know what I expected, but I certainly didn't expect her to leave me. <laughs> um, and not because I adored her, but because she was, we were there, you know, it was the most critical, it was a very critical process that we went through together. Um, um, I didn't have any idea who Kevin Costner was. I didn't have any idea, Re Rebecca I had seen, um, I, but I had, you know, they were not fancy. Um, Philip Anglum, who, the guy who plays the priest, I knew more because he was a Broadway, he was a really respected Broadway actor. I knew who he was, and, and that was exciting. When people came in to read, actors came in to read, every single f fellow who came in said he'd been in seminary. I mean, and I didn't <laughs> know that actors lie. <laughs> and I thought, wow, there are a hell of a lot of Catholic actors. <laughs> Why didn't, why didn't they go to, why didn't they become priests? Um, would have been easier than being an actor. Um, um, but they really lie. Um, um, uh, oh. Hmm. He's terrific. He's terrific. I mean, he has exactly the kind of lousy energy. You know, he's, a, he's an <laughs> arrogant bastard. And he was on set. And I had one showdown with him. The thing that happens is that it seems to me that within two weeks, there's an uprising in the crew. Maybe maybe it was you know, it was about two weeks, where they size you up and they figure that, that that's, that, okay, now we're going to punch him out or punch her out. And and there's like a, a shakedown. And I had to say, primarily to him, that although I had enormous respect for him, and I knew he'd been on 4,000 times more sets than I had ever been on. I knew more about this story than he would ever know. And shape up. <laughs> um, I mean, he came in and he did not really ride a bike well. And he had promised that he could ride a bike really well. <laughs> I mean, it's little things, but it's the whole opening of the film. You know, he had to know how to ride that damn bike. Um, it was obvious. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm glad I wasn't a bike rider, but <laughs> the hell with him. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, he was good in bed. I mean, he was. <laughs> And Lucas Haas, the, how was he? Well, his found? parents were wonderful. And what you're yeah. dealing with when you hire a kid are the parents. Yeah. Um, that's the deal. And his parents were wonderful. His father was an artist. His mother, I think, was a writer. And they were not, they were, co they were nice people. Um, I mean, that's the deal with kids. You're dealing with their parents, and most of them are lousy. So this was not, this was not the case. Most of the parents are lousy. Yeah, the parents. Um, um, so I was lucky there. And um, Rossi and Roxana were, were teenagers, but they weren't, they were minors. We had teachers on the set all the time and short working hours for the kids. Um, but Stevie was amazing. And, um, and we got through it. And the deal is, the thing that was, the thing that I liked and we did work this out in advance, is that as the story got awfuler and awfuler, the picture had to get beautifuler and beautifuler. Um, that was the conceit. And that's, that was a good idea. I think we have time for one more question. Now we're going to go get a drink. Yeah. Oh, listen, so I, I called over to... The Napa Valley the Grill. The Napa Valley Grill, and they have a corner for as many people as want to come, and I hope we come. I Please hope you come. Please join us. Please. Yeah. You don't have to drink if you don't <laughs> drink. You can just suck your thumb or something. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end it, okay. actually. Lynn, thank you so much thank for you, coming thank out you. tonight. This is really great. Thank you.